Hi, this is part two of an interview I've been doing with uh, <coughs> Fakir Musafar. And Fakir is considered the father, father of the uh, modern primitive movement in which people are encouraged to explore and actually play with their own bodies. Fakir says that your body belongs to you. It doesn't belong to anybody else. Use it. Play with it. And uh, for many people, that sounds kind of like something you're not supposed to say and, and not uh, something you're supposed to do. But we're going to uh, look at a book that he came up with in which he photographs himself doing various things. And after I got over the initial shock of it, I discovered that the photographs are actually quite beautiful and indeed what he's doing can be considered play. So with that in mind, Fakir, thank you for being on again. All right, yeah. Yeah, uh, Fakir, we ended the last show. Um, These are the hooks I hang by. For the what ceremony? For the Okipa ceremony that's hanging up by piercings uh, mm -hmm. and going into other worlds. Right, and, and the piercings are in your chest? Yes, these are for chests here. Right, and so you're suspended into a tree and right. and you have an out-of-body experience and mm -hmm. you connect with a great white You can pool. travel into the unseen world, which coexists with us. To the spiritual world. This is the, the Sufi do this, the Native Americans do this, and the Hindus have been doing this for three or 4,000 years in India. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, during that ceremony, in which you're hoist up in a tree, what did it feel like? Did you experience intense pain? Uh, you do with all body rituals, but that's a part of the whole thing. It takes you out of your head. You can be trained, so this is intense physical sensation. I mean, this is sensation, that's sensation. It's just a matter of scale. Mm -hmm. So uh, Native Americans that I grew up with, they had learned, and I found out from them that there are ways that you can train yourself. The same thing goes for the yogas in India. You can train yourself to moderate or mitigate sensation. Mm -hmm. So we teach that in the schools that I have, and I practice that for something like 50 years. And that's basically what's going on. It looks horrible. It looks painful, but it isn't. It's just this side of ecstasy. The object is to throw you into an ecstatic state when you do these things and you do them in ritual and you do them with this kind of training. Mm -hmm. Fakir, because um, seeing even photographs of what you do uh, strikes people as being so unusual and, 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 and shocking, um, what gave you the courage to pursue this? Well, frankly, when I was young, as we explained on part one, right. uh, I was bored. <laughs> <laughs> when you're that bored, you're desperate. You, you lived in just South about any, I lived in South Dakota in a very dull farming community. And other than the Native Americans, which gave me a different insight, uh, yes, it was incredibly boring. Uh -huh. But uh, the spiritual fulfillment, fulfillment that you got out of it kept you going with it, kept you... Yes, and it was almost by accident. It was almost like curiosity and trying to escape boredom when I started doing these uh, private experiments in my teens. Mm -hmm. I started very young, 14, right. 13, 14 years right. old. But now you're not doing it to escape well, boredom. Well, I had just, you'd say almost by accident, but I see there was something guiding me here. I always felt there was guidance there. Mm -hmm. I didn't know exactly what it was until I went out of my body and had that experience meeting the white light when I met the divine self, the mm -hmm. white light. So is your motivation, would you say your motivation now is, can I use the word spiritual, is that it? Well, that's a pretty good way to put it. It's not religious. Religious usually implies there's some kind of order to this thing, and uh, it isn't involved usually rituals like the Native Americans or the Hindus or the Sufi. Mm -hmm. It doesn't involve things like piercing your body. I mean, people run in horror at that. You know, everything in Western culture is pretty much mental. Right, right. And, you know, I think there are a gazillion people in Western culture, and they're always very concerned about, they want to know more about themselves. But so intellectually. They see, yeah, in, they see analysts, they see, uh, they meditate and so on. And most of that will take you so far down the stream, but it won't take you down to the very end of the stream where, or up where it began, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes you have to involve the body. The body is a very key element here. And uh, you've learned some things from the rituals in India. And one of them, I think, was called, what is it? Kavadi? Yes, uh, taking Kavadi. They have a, uh, in the Tamil culture in South India, uh, those are the people who gave us all the yogas, like Hatha Yoga, mm -hmm. Raha Yoga, Bhakta Yoga, all of the yogas. And they also gave us this, this beautiful language, Sanskrit, which they still chant in, in their temples, which I love dearly. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, uh, have rituals several times a year, to different uh, of their, quote, patron saints, I guess you call them. They're living entities to these people and to me. Right. 
And in one of those, uh, the Taipu Psalm is one that's very big. That one's in uh, when the Tai, let's see, when the Star Psalm is Tai is ascended. Anyway, it's in late January or February, and I've been to that, and mm -hmm. it's amazing. I've always wanted to go to that. They bear the cavity. The cavity is a large iron framework. And in the original version of it, you were pierced with many, many long spears. And then you walked and you danced to ecstasy in this thing, and you carried this thing for hours and walked many, many miles in it. The object is, again, like hanging by flesh hooks or doing any of the physical body rituals. It's to throw you out of your head, out of your mind, and get you conditioned in such a state that you can actually transcend body, transcend the physical world. So you actually decided that you would do it. I would bear the comedy. So I did bear the comedy. Uh, I did this many times. I think uh, we have a film of that, which I mm -hmm. did about the fourth or fifth time. Uh, and we tried to do it as authentically as we could as they did it in India. Right. And you did that here in Northern California? I did it in Northern California. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see a, um, a clip of that, and you can explain what we're seeing as we're seeing it. So can we see okay, that? Okay, Mel, sure. Now this is the... Now this uh, is suspension. This is another uh, custom from India. Right. And in this, uh, the man, this was shot by a man, a British uh, teacher on a 16 millimeter camera in the 1920s. And one of the customs of this ritual, this body ritual, is to pierce someone in their back. I think there's a close-up of the hooks. And use hooks very much like I held up at the beginning here, maybe a bit smaller. They put them up in the air on this pole and suspend them around. And he's not doing that struggling there for, uh, he's doing it because he's going into an ecstatic state, actually. Now this is you? Now this is me doing the uh, a, a recreation of a Hindu ritual, which I always wanted to do. And this one, I'm taking comedy. I'm taking this framework as my, not penance, but mm -hmm. my way into other worlds and a way into ecstatic states. And in this one, uh, I had something like 80 spears pierced into me. They're like four feet long. And uh, then uh, after we got them in and I danced around a while, we put weights on the end, balls, and I went into an ecstatic state. Oddly enough, I have one man behind there who is actually a Jewish rabbi, and he's singing uh, Hebrew songs as I dance in my comedy. I thought that was rather ironic, and he thought this was a very great way to experience inner self. Were you in pain here? You're never in pain. You're only in pain at the beginning of these rituals, and of course you've been conditioned, or you condition yourself, through training to moderate physical sensation, see? Mm -hmm. So once you get flying, uh, the first time I did this was indoors. I went into an ecstatic state and I drifted out of my body and again had a, like the near-death experience, the same thing. I drifted out of my body and floated overhead and watched this robot running around underneath <laughs> bearing all the, right. these weights with uh -huh. all of these spears pierced in. And oddly enough, you physiologically change when you do these things. You could, there I have a cheek spear, I'm pulling it out here. Uh -huh. Was there any pain associated with that? Well, look at my face. It looks like it was a little uncomfortable. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> but oddly enough, you can make all of these punctures and piercings in your body, and if you're in an ecstatic state, 20 minutes later, there's no sign that you've ever been pierced. They'll totally mm -hmm. vanish. Right. Now, Fakir, you have a body piercing school. Would you, <clears throat> what kind of people come to these schools? Uh, the people that come to my schools are the people who are outliers, who are loners, the people who feel like they don't belong anywhere, they've been outcasts. Uh, I get a high percentage of uh, people who have been cutters. Mm -hmm. And I've dealt in the psychiatry world. I have a lot of friends, and I'm quite in with the psychiatrists in this country. Uh, so a lot of the people that come to my class, like anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of the students that come have been cutters. In other words, they're people who have tried to relieve their internal and psychological pressures by cutting themselves with razor blades or something. Mm -hmm. Now this can either be antisocial, it can be hidden and disguised in our culture, and it usually is. Young girls will lock themselves in a the bathroom and slash away. They're not trying to commit suicide. They're not trying to kill themselves. They're trying to express what's inside themselves. Some and this kind is of the, pain? Yes. Through this ritual, they are trying to uh, heal themselves. In many cases, they do. Now, we found that if they take it and put it into a more socialized form, like there are groups of women, primarily lesbian, gay women, who have done this in San Francisco. I know of a group up there. And they meet regularly in a social context and do rituals where one will be cut and the others will be support troops and do it in a highly ritualistic fashion. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the expert who, uh, uh, who a psychological expert on this is Dr. Armando Favazza. Um, he's written a book called Bodies Under Siege about this whole phenomena, mm -hmm. and he changed his whole stance on what is going on here. He was multicultural, first of all, in his studies, but he realized that what was appearing to be sickness might not be sickness, and there was a social way to handle this urge, this impulse, because it's universal, it's in all cultures and all peoples. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I heard of uh, some cases where people uh, had been traumatized in their youth and because of, what was it, some kind of guilt over what they had been through, they were trying to punish themselves by cutting. Uh, uh, people like this must come to your That's school. That's not but exactly what the cutters say. Oh, okay. If you talk to the cutters, and I've talked to hundreds of them, uh, they got a release, but and very often then they, they seek out, they know that this is not a socially good way uh, for them, a personally good way to solve what's inside them, their 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 mm -hmm. emotional urge. Right. Do you somehow transmute it into, into that yes. positive? Yes, in the body piercing and in the tattooing that's very popular today, people are finding a more acceptable way to express primitive urges. See, and you also do branding. Yes, what I is also branding. Branding is taking. Well, there's several ways to do branding, like uh, the Native Americans did it as fire direct. As a show uh, to become a warrior in certain tribes, you had to take pointy, dried, needle sharp, uh, needle pine needles and insert them under the skin, pierce them, mm -hmm. then light them, and they would burn down literally into the body and create hash marks. So that was initiation that involved uh, pain, ritual, and a mark. Right. Uh Mark seems to be important for many of these people, and you are involved in tattooing also, I think? Yes, to a certain degree, okay. yes. Um, I understand that there is, uh, can be a power, a, maybe a shamanic power that is associated with tattooing, but, mm -hmm. but is it because you have an experience that causes you to want to kind of memorialize it in a tattoo, or does the power come from that tattoo itself? In other know. cultures where tattooing originated, like in Southeast Asia, in uh, Micronesia, in Melanesia, mm -hmm. uh, in these cultures, I've been to those places, I found out that for the most part in Borneo, uh, the mark itself does something. At the moment you make the mark, you are literally changing somebody's um, approach or appearance in life. Like in Borneo, if a young man has a hard time attracting women, mm -hmm. he doesn't see a psychiatrist, he doesn't, he doesn't go down and buy Viagra. Maybe right. they do now. <laughs> but they go see the tattoo artist, and he tells them his problem. The tattoo artist has a solution for most problems, if you have a sore liver or whatever. Mm -hmm. So they say, this is what you need, and they take big blocks with designs and go ka-chunk on the man, young man's thigh. Then they tattoo it in there. When the young man leaves, he expects the girls are going to chase him down the street, and nine times out of ten, they do. Native American culture, same thing. In other cultures, same thing. Making the bright mark creates a certain kind of magic and changes everything in your aura. Everything around you becomes different. Is it because that you have physically changed now that you have a mark that you cannot remove, you're a different person? It's because the mark itself has to be very specific and it has to be very special and it has to be just right for the magic you need done. It's like they didn't realize this in Western culture. The old sailors in the whaling days went out into the South Pacific. They came back with these marks that wouldn't wash off. Mm -hmm. It was amazing in Portugal and Spain and England, you know. Mm -hmm. However, they, they came back with a way to make marks that don't wash off. They forgot to bring back the magic that goes <laughs> with the marks. Right. And so mm -hmm. we're just now rediscovering it. That's actually part of the modern primitive movement. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, tribal tattooing is being done. It's called black work. I got the first one in this culture, as far as I know, about 1960s. And you had dreams about that for some yes, time. Yes, I had a vision, and that's where you find your tattoo. If you really have something that's going to work magic, usually people say, fuck here, I want a tattoo, what should I get? I say, I don't know. Go on a vision quest, and you see something, and you see it on your body, that's your mark. Go get it. Right. Uh, so these, um, and, and you ritualize these things. You ritualize tattoos. You ritualize piercings. Yeah, ritualizing what? is making it, uh, making it uh, a specific thing done a specific way for a purpose. Not because, you know, the girl gets the thing in her navel because I want to look pretty or mm -hmm. every other girl has it. That's not a good reason. That's not going to be magic as a rule. Mm -hmm. Even though sometimes it is. <laughs> so how does the ritual spiritualize it? Uh, well, I don't know if that's the right way to say this. Okay, mm. then correct me. You, you said that 
Uh, we need ritual in order to properly align spirit with flesh, spirit and body. Yeah, our, How entrance, is that? our entrance to spirit is actually through the body. Why the heck are we here in a body in the first place? Tell me. So that we can learn something because we have a body. And right. what is it we learn? We learn to transcend the body and we can live in the body more successfully and get more out of living in a body after we've made this body-spirit connection. See, that's really my purpose in life, Mel. It's to help people make this body-spirit connection. Mm -hmm. And you can't really do that if you ignore the body. I can sit in Zazen all day, which I've tried, and all I do is get a sore button and erotic fantasies and or something. And excruciating pain after a while, right. <laughs> yeah, my legs hurt. Right. Um, and some people have remarkable success with that and seem to achieve some kind of spiritual elevation. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, we have a body, and our body is very useful for finding our way backward to the spirit that animates the body, because that's mm -hmm. what it's all about. Yeah. We are just the power that animates our body, nothing more, nothing less. Right. Fakir, you've uh, kind of chronicled this experience with uh, Spirit and Flesh in this beautiful book that you've uh, come up with. There's a very brief written introduction. And uh, when I first looked at this, it uh, really stirred me up. Uh, I can't show most of this on camera, but I will show some things uh, for the benefit of the audience. And uh, this really stirred me up. I saw pictures of uh, uh, nude people in here, and I couldn't figure out what that was a man or a woman. But whatever it was, it was equally attractive. Mm -hmm. you know, I just couldn't make out what it was. And there are, um, let's see here. Androgyny is hep right now. <laughs> well, yeah. Especially in the... Yeah, do we have someone on? Well, we can see this. This is uh, what? Uh, this is an example of a uh, recreation of making myself into a living statue. This is called the Golden Apollo. And uh, in, to disguise my face so that I didn't look like a humanoid, I actually had to make this mask, which I wear in this photograph, which is not gold in this. It used to be gold. Mm -hmm. But I have gold gilt all over my body, and I have large piercings with rings in them through my nipples. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that mode, I actually transform and act and become kind of different than I am when I'm sitting here with a shirt and pants on. How are you different? Uh, somehow the spirit of what you're trying to capture uh, you, you touch it a little bit. A little bit of its essence flows into you. Does that empower you? It... Yeah, it does. And it's a wonderful experience as to be something that's b bigger or beyond or greater than you are as your normal walking mm -hmm. self, consciousness. And explain this. Uh, this is uh, when I first started uh, finding that it was uh, from a Hindu culture. Piercing and hanging weights on a on your body and dancing to ecstasy, mm -hmm. uh, it's a great way to get into a trance state, an altered state, and in that altered state, then you can again uh, drift off and go into unseen worlds, you know, that exist coexist with us. Right. Mm -hmm. And here's the cavity. Uh, yeah. Ceremony. In the book You're is being... uh, some pictures of the cavity. Yeah. Do you have marks from these piercings? On Not you? really. Here's the amazing part about most of these rituals, and they do this like in Indian and, and Jordan and places mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. They put very large objects, pierce it through their cheeks or through parts of their fleshy body, mm -hmm. and you can pull these out and just go like this and touch those places where you've been pierced, and in 20 minutes the marks are gone. You're healed. Right. And here is um, uh, a piercing. Uh, we saw the hooks at yeah, the beginning the of the show. Yeah, these are the hooks down here. Uh, th this, th these hooks can support your, the weight of your body? Oh, yes. Yes. And you can hang on much less than that. We do a lot of suspensions. They're very popular right now. And so I'm involved and have started or did start what is considered the body suspension movement, which, mm -hmm. you know, it goes back 20 or 30 years now. Right. And here, uh, this is a classic. Uh, explain this, please. Okay. This is body, <laughs> this, this is body modification. In this case, I started out like the Ibito of New Guinea. Mm hmm uh, the young men there became dandies, and the dandier you were, the smaller your waist was. So they compressed the waist on certain young men till they were microscopic. Now, mm -hmm. in our culture, we've had that same thing going uh, with corsetry. Right. So I also, because it was in our culture, I decided to learn how to make corsets for three or four years. I designed and made corsets, and I put myself in a corset here with a 19-inch waist, about that big. And you started your own company, the Hourglass Corset Yes, I had the Hourglass Corset <laughs> Company. I have a checkered career. I was also a demolition expert yeah, I know. in the Army. So yeah, they, um, they you know, looking over this that. book, it... Um, 
uh, there's some things I, I can't um, show here because it's, uh, I, mean, I just can't do it for Well, if you want to see them, you buy the book. <laughs> well, yeah, see it, buy the book. <laughs> I guess. But any, eventually I got over the, the, the shock, and I think, how do most people react to this book? How do people react to it when they first see it? Um, they usually stop. I love to watch from a distance when a group of people look at this book and see mm -hmm. which pictures they stop at. Uh -huh. And a lot of them are the ones that mostly run bumper to bumper with the cultural no-nos, taboos of our culture. Is that why you did the book? So that No, the... no, I did the book because I, I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> I just yeah. wanted to show what we were doing, you know. Uh -huh. but, and I know that it was contraire, it was outlier, it was yeah. for our culture. Right. But you but knew I that this our, would push people's buttons. Yeah, our culture is at a point where its buttons need pushing, you know. Yeah. Well, I have to admit that, that I felt uh, kind of creepy feelings I haven't felt before, and I guess my buttons were being pushed. But uh, as I got to know you a little bit better, and as I looked through the book, I remembered what you said, that uh, you know, our body belongs to us. It doesn't belong to other people. Play with it. And uh, I can't say that I'm going to play with it the way you do, but... <laughs> well, but, maybe we'll see it at one of our Spirit Plus well, special shows. we got one coming up in December. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, but, but as I went through the book, you know, and as I got to know yeah. uh, you a little bit better, and as I, I leafed through it, I could see, you know, the photography here is really beautiful, and it's your photography. Yes. And uh, I, I could see that, uh, you know, here is a, a man that, who's actually enjoying himself, who's, who's actually having fun, who's actually playing. Is that how you feel? Absolutely. This is body play. Uh, for uh, nine years, I did a magazine called Body Play, and I would love dearly to do this magazine again. Uh -huh. But in the current cultural and economic situation in our culture, you can't do things like that anymore. Uh, there were a bunch of these kinds of magazines around, and the year that I went down, after mm -hmm. nine years of publishing, uh, 1,200 magazines like that went down. Mm -hmm. So unless you're, unless you're a big multimedia corporation, you can't really do anything. <laughs> right, right. See? Yeah. Uh, uh, Fakir, there, there are two questions. Since I, you know, my show is about uh, creativity, spirituality, and personal growth, yes. mm -hmm. I was interested in what you're doing because there's a spiritual dimension to it in, in a way that I really couldn't have uh, imagined before. And uh, there are two questions I like to ask people, so I'd like to ask you sure. those questions now. Uh, what does the word God mean for you? Well, God is a word that's used heavily in Western culture, mm -hmm. and it has virtually no meaning to me at all. Uh, my first connection with something beyond this narrow concept, mental thing, I was with my Native American friends, and they talked about the Great White Spirit, and I got a good feeling about what they meant by it, and it was infused in everything. Everything that is, everything that's physical and dimension down here is infused with spirit. So that spirit that infuses everything down here, to me, that is G-O-D. It is not a big old guy with a gray beard sitting on a throne saying, don't do this, don't right. do that. Okay, second no, question. No, that's definitely not... Okay. Real. Second question. To me. Uh, what is death for you? Uh, death is an impermanent state between embodiments. Um, I'm very much, because of my experiences and having seen dead people when I was out of my body mm -hmm. and knowing that when you're dead, you're not really dead, including myself. I was out of my body. I was not dead. I was able to go back in and continue living. Uh, death is an impermanent state between embodiments. And one of the things I learned from my guru of 17 years and from my experience out of the body and the white light that uh, I visited uh, is the fact that this is a reality. The part of you, the essence of you, is always around. It always was and always will be. Now we find this in Sufi, we find it in Native American, we find it in Hindu and many other cultures. This understanding, I don't mean belief, because I don't believe in belief. Belief is accepting something because somebody said it's this way. No, belief has no meaning in my life. Only what I have experienced is real. Anything I haven't experienced is not irrelevant. Right. I don't really need it. Right. Uh, Fakir, you just turned 80. Absolutely. And you look terrific. What do you want your legacy to be? I would like uh, what I have started, and I have many protégés now, I have a lot of people through the world, and spread from a four or five, two or three people that I finally confessed to after 30 years in the closet. I had to come out hmm. <laughs> and let people know what I was doing when I found people who would do this and not reject me, you know? Mm -hmm. So I've been very fortunate in gathering around or having people come to me and say, that looks interesting. Maybe that would do something for me. I'd like to try this. So they would let me 
guide them through some of the things that I did. And they had marvelous experiences, marvelous insights and transformations. So now I have a group of protégés. I've been training like body piercers for 20 years now. And I've got something like 1,400 of them out there, all of whom are now well-versed in, in energy movement. Because one of the key things about this as a body virtual, getting a body piercing or a tattoo or any physical thing is, uh, is a transformative aspect to it. And so these people are now out there doing this magic for me. So my, my goal in life, my legacy, is just to leave more and more of these people who in turn leave more and more people until finally we're all a little more enlightened about all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And these people who you've trained, they have had uh, similar spiritual experiences to yourself? Uh, yes, many of them. Uh, we do the uh, hook hanging, the spirit plus flesh rituals we do. We have the body piercers, many of them. Mm -hmm. If they pierce... 20 people a day and they do this for three or four years, I guarantee you they're going to change their view about things. I've had right. one who was a hardcore, and I don't have any problem with being an atheist and a hardcore disbeliever. Don't believe anything until you know it's so. That's right. my attitude. Yeah, Fakir, um, you've had a, an interesting life. And um, uh, you have, you've had a hell of a lot of courage doing what you do. So as you look back at your life way back there mm -hmm. in South Dakota, uh, as a, a man of 80 years old who has uh, followed your bliss, what words of advice would you give to yourself as, let's say, a 12-year-old? Be careful what you listen to and what you accept from other people. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have some kind of a feeling, don't be afraid to follow it. And there's only one real sin, not wanting to know. <laughs> Don't be afraid of anything anybody says, well, here's something you may be interested in or may be good for you or may learn something from. Don't dismiss everything that comes along that spooks you out. Mm -hmm. uh, not, we'll say, well, I want to know a little bit more about it. And I might get to know a little more about it and reject it. That's fine. But not wanting to know, that's the worst thing you can possibly do in life. Right. So not wanting to know is the worst thing Poke you can do. Poke around, search, experiment, try. Don't be afraid of anything. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and try it. Okay. Fakir, our time is up. Well. But uh, knowing you has been an inspiration, uh, this is, is <laughs> new to me, but you've I can't say I want to do some of these things, but uh, okay. my, my attitude toward uh, the spirit, I think, has been changed. I understand now why people do these things, and I'm certainly a lot more, um, I don't want to use the word sympathetic, but I'm more empathic toward it. Let's put it that way. Good. I, I understand what's Good. going on now. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mel. It's been a wonderful opportunity to, to be with you today. Right. Uh, yeah. To the audience out there. Uh, uh, like myself, you were probably shocked at, at some of the things you've seen, but I think um, now that you understand where uh, Fakir is coming from, where his heart is coming from, perhaps uh, it's brought some understanding to something that you didn't know about before. So that's good for everybody. So thank you for watching, and thank you, Fakir, for being here. Well, Fakir. thank you for doing this. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay.